Chapter two in the Jarvis book talks about cultural competence and uh, really it's exploring the importance of the nurse understanding uh, the cultural needs, spiritual needs, and just the personal needs of each individual that you're caring for. To get the most out of this chapter from your textbook, really, I just want you to read for a deeper understanding of the role of the nurse when caring for people of different cultures. And that's honestly every single person that you come in contact with. There are no two people that have every single culture um, the same. Oftentimes even siblings will have different cultures because you, you know, pick up, you know, assimilate pieces from all of the different cultures that you're involved in. So if one sibling's involved in band and another one's involved in chorus or theater or sports or whatever, they're going to have different interests and values. I want you to think about how culture is created and how it's shared from person to person. So how those values and traditions and rituals and rites are, are created and then how they're shared and why those become sacred and important to us and how not being able to perform those or having to let those go can cause stress. Think about what the purpose is of doing a cultural assessment and why understanding the culture or the needs, the individual specific needs of a person is so important when you're planning their care. Think about your priorities and then how you can provide a therapeutic relationship and minimize acculturative stress. Health disparities are very real. They exist in every population, um, in every area throughout our state, our region, our country, our continent, and our world. Health disparities from the standpoint of this book are things that would decrease the availability of access to uh, healthcare or access to the necessary uh, tools to care for yourself. Poverty, vulnerable populations like our mental health clients, our veterans, our homeless populations, our LGBTQ populations, all of those populations are more vulnerable than others because they have, um, you know, extensing, ex extenuating circumstances that increase the risk of them not seeking health care when they need it. If there are language barriers, not only does that decrease the chance that they'll come to a health care facility every time they need care, but it also increases the risk that they won't be able to fully share their story or understand the plan to treat their illness or disease. So all of these limit access to health care, and sometimes it can be a, a physical barrier. You could live someplace where you're four hours from the nearest hospital, and then sometimes it is, um, you know, a, a means or a a mental barrier. Cultural competence itself is really an ongoing continuous process and it's all about becoming respectful and responsive to the cultural beliefs and practices and linguistic needs of the population that you're serving. And yes, Vermont is still one of the whitest states in the nation. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a large variety of cultural beliefs and practices here. Culture itself is determined by the preferences and exposures and backgrounds uh, that each person has, not only you know where they live, so it has something to do with uh, demographics, but then also what languages they've been exposed to how they communicate, their courtesies, their rituals, their roles, their customs, how they view relationships and hierarchies, their practices, what the expected behaviors are within the social group, what things they value 
the most, um, both from a, you know, a, the physical, like, you know, item standpoint, as well as an emotional, like, you know, characteristic standpoint. Um, their thoughts, so ethics, morals, and the manners of interacting. And all of these then are, are molded together to create the culture that forms that person. So if you had multiple um, cultures inputting into one person or a group of people, you would have kind of a blending of those customs and rituals and roles and beliefs and ethics and hierarchies. And you can see how, depending on which one you choose to follow out of every single one of those categories, you can create a very unique personal culture. Acculturative stress then occurs um, when the person who's experiencing acculturation, which is where two or more cultures are coexisting without losing um, you know, yourself to the other culture, when that person has to experience either loss or change related to letting go of some of those prior beliefs, routines, and social roles. Um, in your book on page 15, Table 2-1 does a nice job of just kind of reviewing some of the um, changes that may occur in a person's life as they are trying to adapt to their new situation where they may experience acculturative stress. And these would be things like finance, religion, not that they have to change their religion, but maybe where they worship or when they worship or how they worship may be stressed or strained because maybe they don't have free access to, um, you know, their normal routines. Uh, they may have been a very high ranking individual where they come from and, you know, now they're here and they may have a, a completely different um, financial situation and a completely different social standing. They may have lost their family support or their group of friends. Um, so just figuring out how you're going to fit in and how you're going to change your view of self to kind of mold or fit into this new culture that you're kind of melding with causes this stress and, and you know stress can be good and it can be bad but nonetheless it's still stress so some culturally related concepts um religion and spirituality so the person that you are talking to may look just like you they may be born somewhere near you but may have a completely different culture than you and this is why it's super important to always ask and never assume you want to know about their religious preferences their spiritual beliefs and this really plays in especially at the end of life because people's views of death differ greatly based on their religion and spirituality you want to know about their health and healing beliefs and that includes beliefs about the causes of illness your book does point out some uh, over generalizations of certain groups and populations where um, they may or may not as a whole have certain or tendencies to believe certain things I'm not going to go into that um, and then health literacy so how capable is your patient at reading and understanding um, you know American sixth grade English uh, vocabulary and um, understanding just general health terms right so I heard a really good story the other day about a young black man who was in the ER and uh, this was in England and the it was a medical resident was telling the story and he was saying how um, he was in morning rounds and he heard the chief medical resident and the doctor talking about this young uh, black man who just was absolutely apathetic to the fact that he had just been di diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and 
the resident himself was black and he said what do you mean and they said well you know he thought he was having a stroke and so we said to him you know it's not a stroke and he was so relieved oh thank goodness and we said <clears throat> but you have ms and he didn't seem to care he just sat there and stared at us while we were talking to him never asked any questions didn't get upset or anything and the resident said oh i know exactly what's going on it's not that he's not upset it's just he has no idea what you're saying so we went in and he spoke to him in terms that he understood and said you know it's not it's not uh you know your nerves um like you didn't have a stroke it's not a bleed it's not a clot but it's it's a, like a brain thing where the the sheets in your brain are degenerating <clears throat> and the guy was like what so i have a problem in my brain and you know he said yes and so then suddenly the guy was all full of questions and he you know asked good questions and he was interested and engaged and, and understood but it's just that taking that time to really make sure that the person understands what you're talking about there are certain cultures where it's considered appropriate or polite to nod and smile and make good eye contact even if they don't understand anything you're saying so you could go in you could be speaking to somebody and they you know are smiling and making good eye contact and nodding and you say do you understand and they nod and you think okay great and then you walk away only to find out you know, they didn't understand a word you said so as you know we're on the floor and we're working really making sure that you're asking good questions for understanding and and having the patient provide you some either teach back or um you know answering questions that you have or asking clear questions for clarification would be really helpful people of different cultures express pain differently in some cultures it's okay to express pain in some cultures it's not in some cultures it's expressed incredibly loudly um, and in some cultures it's you know hidden i'm sure you guys have heard that like you know boys don't cry thing um, and for you know grown men uh, a lot of times they try very hard to pretend that they're not in pain which makes a good pain assessment very difficult um, and then sexuality so uh, be careful when you ask somebody about their gender identity or their sexuality be very careful about the words that you choose um, if you need to examine the genitalia of a transgendered person uh, just remember that they're probably just as uncomfortable as you are and they know what they have so really the most important question you can ask is you know i need to either examine your genitalia or i need to you know place a foley or whatever or a straight cast to get some sterile urine um you know uh, i how do you um refer to your genitalia you know so uh, a lot of times they'll have words for it just to use the words that they that they use even if they're not words that you would normally use as a professional use those words so ask them you know what what terms would you like me to use so if you are taking care of somebody especially somebody who's um, only had top surgery and has not had the bottom surgery yet so they're not uh, I hate using that term fully transgendered but if they haven't gone through the complete surgery yet um, just you know be really cognizant of the fact that uh, this you know obviously they know what they have for genitalia but it's something that they're not incredibly uh, comfortable with you exploring either um, as far as sexuality other things go uh, you know there's a lot of times where if it's none of your business you really shouldn't be asking um, there are so many stories out there of patients who um, whether they're transgender or um, you know homosexual that feel like every time they access the healthcare system you know healthcare providers just want to talk to them about stuff like that even though it does not pertain at all to why they're there um, and they feel like they're more put on show than they're actually being cared for so make sure that your line of questioning is pertinent and that it applies to um, you know why it is that you're treating the patient 
you know, if a transgender person comes in for uh, a knee injury or an ankle injury, does it matter that they're transgender? Probably not, right? So why is the cultural history so important for us? Um, if, you know, obviously asking some of these questions could be uncomfortable. Well, one, it gives us a complete history. So in and of itself, it's important. But two, there are genetic traits that pose certain health risks um, because uh, those disorders are only present in certain populations. So um, things like Tay-Sachs disease, sickle cell disease, um, you know, things where you're looking at uh, heritage linking um, for those genetic traits, that it's important to know where people are from. Also, um, health practices. So the plan of care really only works if the patient agrees with it. You can't create a plan of care for a patient that is so far outside of their comfort zone that they're just not going to follow the plan. All right, so if you have somebody who's a, a vegan and you want them to eat, you know, steak five times a week or something, that's not going to fly. Um, same thing, you know, my husband is like a meat and potatoes guy all the way. And if you told him you wanted him to eat vegan, uh, he wouldn't follow that at all either. So the question is always, how do I become a culturally confident provider? Unfortunately, there are just inherent risks with trying to learn about a culture that you don't experience. And the risks include stereotyping and perpetuating false beliefs. There's a great YouTube video about the danger of the single story. But what happens when we write things down in books or when we tell one story about an entire group of people is that we start to believe that that story applies to every single person within that group of people. So honestly, while some of those things may be true, I've met so many people who don't fall within those guidelines that I think that there's just an inherent risk that we may do more harm than good by making assumptions and stereotyping, by reading up quote unquote truths about populations. Rather, I would suggest that it's more important that you're aware of the fact that everyone has a different culture and that you be very purposeful in your attempts to provide culturally competent care to every single patient that you come in contact with and you just be respectful of their wishes and their needs. So seek to understand that all people are individuals with the capacity for multiple cultural influences. Ask and don't assume and then recognize items or rituals of importance to the patient and include them in care or give them the time that they need. So if they have rosary, prayer beads, if they have some sort of, um, you know, a medicine bag or an item um, or even like a prayer rug and it needs to be in a certain place on the floor and face a certain direction, whatever it is, if you can help the patient achieve that goal safely, it should be in their plan of care. Because if it's something that's important to the patient, it needs to be important to us as well.